So we are live. I want to welcome you to the Cochrane District Master Gardeners first webinar and question and answer session live online via YouTube. <clears throat> this is the first webinar hosted by our group. So please forgive any technical issues we may come across. But I am hoping that everything works perfectly tonight. This webinar will be directed by your questions. But first, let's have some introductions. My name is Pamela Delaire, and I am the coordinator of the Cochrane District, District Master Gardeners. I've always been interested in gardening, but until I joined the Master Gardeners of Ontario, I didn't have the skills to be a successful gardener. My ongoing studies in gardening are my relaxing time and they help me unwind. As for butterfly gardening, my specific interests in, are in attracting monarch butterflies. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Cochrane District Master Gardeners. We are located in northeastern Ontario. We are a satellite group under the Thunder Bay and District Master Gardeners and a part of the Master Gardeners of Ontario. We cover a large area from the Quebec border to halfway across the province, north of North Bay and Sudbury to Moosonee and Attawapiskat. We do have a guest speaker tonight and I would like to welcome Ingrid Jensen to the webinar. Ingrid, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Ingrid Jansen, and I'm uh, the co-coordinator this year. So I share the coordinator responsibilities with someone else of the Durham Master Gardeners. The Durham Master Gardener Group is located in Durham region, which is Southern Ontario on the sunny shores of Lake Ontario. And we span the communities from Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, and Clarington and North up into uh, Cannington and Uxbridge. So we're a fairly, um, from for our understanding, a fairly diverse uh, group of gardeners in our uh, uh, in our region as well. Um, I personally have been gardening for a very long time. I've always been interested in learning more about gardening. I've been a master gardener now for five years, and uh, my passions, like Pam, are. I'm very interested in pollinators, monarch butterflies, and what I call uh, naturalized gardening, which is a mixture of uh, native plants and other plants combined together to create an interesting plant community. So that's my interest in gardening. And I wow, have a big that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Ingrid. And now I didn't like to invite the public to join in the conversation. Hopefully we have some public out there, some live public. Now, uh, you will notice at the top of your screen, there is a URL address. The URL address, if you open a new page on your computer or open a page on your phone and type in the URL shown above the page, it will connect you connect with a chat page where you can see all the questions asked during the webinar. Make sure you do keep this YouTube page open so you can see the webinar at the same time. And the URL is goo.gl forward slash slides forward slash 5gyeuq. So if you type that in your address bar, you should find our chat room and I will be able to see if you send us a question. Once the webinar is over, this video will be automatically uploaded to YouTube and it's the same link that you went to to attend the, the live YouTube uh, webinar. So you can watch it later. So don't worry if you're interrupted and have to leave the live show, you can watch it again. You don't have to take notes if we're talking about plants. You can go back and rewind it and watch it again to look at the plants that we're discussing tonight. 
And any question we don't have time to answer live, we can answer on our Facebook pages. For the Northern Ontario District, please visit our Facebook page, the Cochrane District Master Gardeners. And if you live in Southern Ontario, or a little more south than Northern Ontario, please ask a question on the Durham Master Gardeners Facebook page. Both of these groups are available all year to answer your gardening questions. So I invite you to go ahead and join the chat page and start asking us some questions. But in the meantime, <laughs> we'll start giving you our webinar. <clears throat> And to begin with, we're going to discuss what does a butterfly garden look like and where is it? Now, Ingrid was nice enough yesterday to discuss this with me. And um, many people imagine a garden like this, pots or flowers with blooming flowers of all types, shapes and sizes. Um, many of the plants may be annuals from a store, have fragrance or no fragrance, and you may have not put any thought into the purchase of the flower and just bought whatever you think might be appealing to butterflies. I live in Smooth Rock Falls, which is one hour north of Timmins, Ontario, and our gardens are in zone two to three, depending on the location. Now, I see a lot of wild butterfly habitats on the edges of man-made spaces and wild on the edge of roadsides, edges of, edges of farms um, full of native or non-native adapted plant species. But I'm sure of you, most of you have seen beautifully manicured gardens in town that do attract butterflies and other pollinators. A garden planted specifically for butterflies should take into account the soil type in your garden, the amount of sun it receives, and the type of butterfly you are trying to attract. But butterfly plants also live in damp habitats. They're plants for your specific location, whether it be in the far north or farther south in Ontario. We don't have any questions yet, so if you're out there, you can join the conversation by going to the URL address above the screen. So what butterflies live in your area? Now, Ingrid, I know you know a lot about more about butterflies than I do, since I specifically I'm interested in monarch butterflies. I know there's a viceroy that looks like a monarch butterfly. <laughs> but um, do, do you have um, a way that people can easily identify butterflies in, in our areas? I do have on the screen um, a link from the Canadian government. It's a uh, butterfly bank in Canada, and I will put the link on our Facebook page. And it does have all the butterflies in Canada and gives information on their range and their host plants and things like that. But I know I do have a, a, an insect identification book, and that's basically what I use. And I actually write in it, if I have seen a butterfly or moth in my area, I will write down the date and what it was doing just so that I get an idea of when I might see that butterfly again. But two days ago, I saw a butterfly here go by my deck and there is no flowers, there is no plants, the grass is just coming out from the snow and I have no idea what it's going to eat. <laughs> But do you have um, any good books or suggestions on where people can get some information on butterflies? I do. As a matter of fact, I happen to have in front of me, and this specific book is from the Xerxes Society. And let me spell that. So it's, it's the Xerxes, X-E-R-C-E-S Society. And they actually have a website, which you can just Google, the Xerxes Society. 
The book that I have is on attracting native pollinators, but I was on their website earlier today and they have introduced a new one on uh, specifically on butterflies as well. Um, I do have an Audubon guide on butterflies. So that I find is a big help for me because I like you, I see a butterfly in my garden and I try and run out and see how close I can get to it, usually with my iPhone to try and capture a picture so I can identify it as well. So those are two of the sources that I know that are very um, great, as well as the Butterflies of Canada resource that you've identified here on the screen. So, um, and there is a second book that I use. Um, it's a Canadian author. The name is Pollinators of Native Plants. The author's name is Heather Holm, H-O-L-M. And she does have a website, um, She's a graduate of the University of Guelph, but now lives in Minnesota, and she identifies a lot of plants and pollinator plant interactions, focusing a lot on bees, but there is good information on butterflies as well. So that, that is another resource that I use. That's wonderful. That sounds like a lot of information and hopefully we'll be going and checking out the websites. And if you sent me the link, to uh, any of those places, then I can put them on our Facebook page as well afterwards, so. Okay, I can do that. I was just going to, um, oh, hang on, I think I just lost, I was gonna actually type them in the, um, the Q&A part, but. No, it's all right, we'll add them to the Facebook we'll page add, okay. later. I will, uh, I will make a note and I will send that so we can add them to the Facebook page in case people want to, uh, to refer to those. That's great. Okay. So we'll go on. So I wanted to take a quick, a very quick look at butterfly anatomy and development, just so everyone gets an idea what the needs are of butterflies and in their different stages of life. <clears throat> so an adult butterfly, obviously it's a winged animal and it is designed to do basically three things to drink nectar they're there for sex and they lay eggs to produce the next generation now an egg is laid on a specific host plant that will serve as a home and source of food for the hatchling larva commonly referred to as a caterpillar During the larval stage, it basically just eats and eats and gets bigger and bigger until it's at the stage of forming a pupa. And that's where the larva transforms into a butterfly. And it's usually attaches somewhere protected and usually on or near its host plant. Do you have anything to add to that, Ingrid? No, that's, uh, that's pretty much, um, monarchs do um, attach their um, pupa, pupae in odd places, sometimes under decks or under the roof of a shed, or you'll find them in different locations, sheltered and usually out of direct sunlight, but quite often on a, yeah, but on a plant. They would have to crawl there, though. So, I mean, yeah. it's not going to be a great distance from their no. host plants. No, no. It'll be generally in the area of where they, um, where they were feeding. Yes. Okay, now let's look at how butterflies eat during the different stages of their life. An adult butterfly de devotes most of its time finding nectar sources which give them energy to mate and produce eggs. Adults, strangely, find their food by tasting the air with receptors on their feet, searching for sources of sweet nectar. That's why they always do a little dance when they get on a flower. They're actually tasting to see whether it's suitable. Adult butterflies also need minerals and moisture to sustain their flight. They find minerals and moisture on animals, such as humans, on objects, obviously 
us humans, gardeners, have been using tools and leaving our minerals behind. So you'll find them on places that we have touched or where your dog has urinated <laughs> or other places. <laughs> And they, they do uh, puddling in mud puddles. So this is where they're actually getting moisture and minerals. And a lot of times I find them on clay roads. So where clay has uh, made puddles after a rain or in damp areas, there's always butterflies in the puddles on our clay roads because we basically have a clay base and there's lots of minerals for them. And those are not our butterflies, but I couldn't find another picture of puddling butterflies, so <laughs> I chose that one. And the adult butterfly has a proboscis for feeding, and it is a tube instead of a mouth. At rest, it's curled up under its head, but it unfurls to feed. And it allows them to suck tubular flower like a straw. I think it's really interesting. They're kind of cute. And because they have a proboscis, butterflies prefer tubular flowers because it can insert the proboscis into the flower to drink the nectar. And this, as an example, is a pretty roughed up Monarda plant. And some plants with tubular flowers can be deceiving um, most ray-shaped flowers, like daisies, coneflowers, and sunflowers, contain tiny tubular flowers that are within the circle. And the ray, the ray petals on the outside have nothing to do with the flower. Each of those little tubular flowers inside is a separate flower. And the... Um, butterfly can drink out of each of those flowers to get their nectar. But the feeding needs of the egg, well they don't eat when they're in the egg, but as soon as they hatch the larva uh, depend on the host plants. And they rely on host plants for food and for overwintering butterflies. They need shelter in their pupa until their emergence the next spring. And I'm just going to check to see if we have any audience. We have no questions yet. We may not have an audience. I don't know. But we're out there broadcasting on YouTube. So I made an easy way to make a butterfly garden. Basically, the five steps to creating a butterfly garden. <clears throat> Nectar plants have evolved along with the butterflies and basically require the same environment as the butterflies do. So we'll go over the five steps. Most plants that feed butterflies need some sun every day. Wouldn't you agree, Ingrid? We were talking about that yesterday. I don't know how much sun they require, but... By and large, plants that are shade plants are not uh, nearly as floriferous. In other words, they don't get um, a lot of flowering to them. So it's generally the plants that grow in either full sun or part sun that tend to have the most attractive flowers for butterflies. Yes. And I was reading um, a scientific paper that was measuring the weight of caterpillars the butterfly caterpillars on the plants. And not only that, they were actually seeing how much nitrogen they were taking up from the plants and chemicals. And they were saying a healthy plant and an older plant will actually feed the caterpillar faster. And the caterpillar will get bigger than a weakened, younger, smaller plant, not in as much sun. So, the night I believe they said, and anyone can tell me I'm wrong on this, but the amount of nitrogen and the amount of sun played an important part in how healthy the plant was and how healthy the caterpillar living on that plant was. 
So it's something to look into. I thought it was interesting anyway. Well, I mean, a plant generates food through photosynthesis. So the more sun, the more photosynthesis. That all makes sense, right? Yeah. And so if it's got more plant to feed on, <laughs> it's going to get a fatter caterpillar. <laughs> Um, do you know, I, I haven't even looked this up, um, let's say a monarch caterpillar, I know they need more than one plant. I guess you, I don't know how many plants one caterpillar would have to eat. I know to, to get to the point of going into the pupil stage. I, don't I know they said it's more than one plant. They need multiple plants, groupings of plants. Which is why the most successful places for monarch caterpillars are those that have colonies of milkweed. So in my yes. milkweeds, I will notice uh, two or three caterpillars on different plants. And if I come back the next day, they're, on, they're not on the same plants. They're on a different plant. So they do move, um, and I think that's why it's good if you're going to provide certain host plants for butterflies that you cluster them. You don't just plant one here and one there. You need to have them grouped together, I think would be a good recommendation. Hey, yes, if you've have ever had a cabbage patch and you've tried to grow it and you have the cabbage white butterfly larva eating your cabbage you know they don't stay on one cabbage <laughs> they go to all the cabbages <laughs> no, I'm not something like a chipmunk take a bite out of one take a bite out of other they can't just stay on one they gotta move <laughs> so. oops i missed one okay um butterflies are cold-blooded and need warm temperatures to be active so in the sunshine where those warm plants are, they will uh, warm up fast. So those sunny plants in the sunny areas um, are actually um, better than a, a shady area because they'll be more active for longer. And the sunlight also provides reflective rays which show the adult butterflies where to land, which is I find is really interesting. In ultraviolet light, our colorful flowers look different. They look black, white, gray, depending on the light that the butterflies see. And it provides guides to, to show them where the nectar is located in the flower. And I have an example of this on the left-hand side of the screen, or the I'm not sure which way it's going to show on YouTube, but on the one side of the screen, we have a flower in ultraviolet light and it looks very light yellow and there's a bright black center. And on the right hand side, we see it in our visual range of sunlight. And all we see is this nice yellow and brown flower. We do not see that, that um, indication where it shows where to go for the nectar. It's a big, big landing pad for the butterflies. I always call them helicopter landing pads because that's exactly what <laughs> Yes, and I'm, I'm always surprised when um, a butterfly can land on a tiny little flower, but usually the tiny flowers are grouped so tightly together that they have a bigger landing pad. I'd like to see what those tiny little flowers look like, you know, in ultraviolet light compared to the big ones. <laughs> So the second step to creating a butterfly garden is butterflies need protection in a few ways. First of all, they need protection from the wind because wind draws away heat created by the sun and because they're cold blooded, they need warmth. And also the adult butterflies can have their wings damaged in high winds. <clears throat> and here's an example of a viceroy butterfly, which is similar to a monarch. We see them often up here. Um, the wings can get damaged by wind, rain, sleet, and sometimes a bird will try to grab them. 
So, and freezing temperatures. So they're very fragile little, little wings. And what's really neat, if you've ever had to rescue a butterfly, you may find some of their tiny little scales on is there something like fish scales they're overlapping scales and um, the color is actually in the scales and they might come off in your hand if you're not careful so they're just like a fragile little thing of scaly <laughs> color and gardeners you might say why do we have to be careful of gardeners well butterfly larva and pupa need protection from gardeners because this means you when you're out there pruning your damaged and dead parts of your plants you may be removing material inhabited by larva or pupa so what I'd suggest is leave your de dead plant material over winter instead of cleaning it up in the fall. Uh, remove it in the late spring or early summer when the butterflies are emerging. Otherwise, if you're determined to move it and you don't know if there's any pupa on your pupae on your your dead plants um, you could stack them in a corner don't lay them down they'll get all wet but you could stack them in a corner something like hay and outside and wait until don't move it until the uh, early spring when all the uh, butterflies are emerging and another thing that gardeners do is they love to take out their hose and put it on full blast and the water can blow off caterpillars. Yes, it'll blow off aphids, but it will blow all those beautiful butterfly caterpillars and the pupae that are resting, waiting to emerge right off the plants. So I'd say water your plants from the bottom <clears throat> or put it on the rain <laughs> cycle of your hose contraption whatever whatever is the lightest watering ability but watering from the bottom is always a good idea don't you think so Ingrid <laughs> yeah I, I would agree with that in in general that um, just to be water efficient you always want to direct the water to the roots of the plant as opposed to spraying all the leaves and and possibly also encouraging um, fungus infection so for my yeah my recommendation is always try and get the water as close to the root zone as possible that's great <laughs> we actually have <laughs> someone watching <laughs> um i'll just uh, give me two seconds and i'll see if she has a question I haven't seen any questions yet. I'm looking. We, she wants to know, uh, Colette wants to know if we were talking about target species of plants in a garden to keep caterpillars from chewing your prized flower plants. <laughs> well, we're encouraging caterpillars, but we don't really want the bad ones. But do you have any suggestions when, like, uh, I know Colette um, hybridizes flowers. And um, she has orchids, and she has brugmansias, and she has daylilies that she hybridizes. And but it, those kind of things would be host specific, wouldn't they? They would be specific to a a type of either bug. It might not even be a caterpillar. It might be. Um, It'd be earwigs for all I know. I mean, yeah, I, that was my first thought was earwigs. Oh, they're terrible. They climb right up the walls of my greenhouse. So, I mean, the the problem is if you have something that's attacking an ornament, a prized ornamental plant, what you need to do is buy yourself some sticky traps. And, you know, there are those little yellow stickies or... Um, there are other ways of trapping, so earwigs, typically it's a piece of hose laid at the base of a plant that they crawl in at night, but you have to find out what it is that's attacking it, because I think it's, it's a shame that people sort of generalize and think that all things that are eating plants must be, you know, butterfly cat, they could be moths, it could be, um, but it could be any kind of, of um, you know, plant eating insect. So 
until you can identify it, it's difficult to make a recommendation on what plants to plant that would distract that particular insect away. Yes, and corrugated cardboard. Corrugated cardboard is a great place for bugs to hide too. Exactly. If you have, yes. So they can get in the little holes and then you take it away from the plants and shake it and see what's in them. And then I guess once she knows what's in them then uh, what's attacking, then she'd have to be specific on her uh, catching or attacking of that bug. But I Yes. For those specific plants, I, I can't even think of uh, of any butterflies that would be interested in those plants up here because they are um, more toxic as well. <clears throat> Lilies and uh, angel trumpet vine and things like that. <clears throat> I, I can't think off the top of my head of a butterfly species that would feed on any one of those. No, I can't either. So we'll go back to the, uh, the slideshow for the moment. <clears throat> and we welcome any more questions. Um, butterfly larvae need host plants to feed on. And host plants are necessary in all the stages. Um, they spend all their time on the host plant until they become a butterfly, growing from an egg and then hatching and eating and eating and eating until they're ready to form a pupa where they transform. And during this time, they need a constant supply of their own specific host plant or they'll die. And some butterflies, the larva, can live on different plants of the same family, such, such as the white cabbage butterfly, which everyone dreads that I was talking about, that can feed on kale, broccoli, cabbage, and other brassicas. And some butterflies can only feed on one species of plant, like the monarch butterfly, and that's what I'm interested in. And it can only feed on milkweed or Asclepias. Am I saying that properly, Asclepias? Asclepias. I say Asclepias, Asclepias, but... Asclepias, Asclepias. During the larval stage, it needs... But there is different species of milkweed. Correct. So there... Guaranteed there is one that you can grow in your area, whether you're in Southern Ontario, Northern Ontario. Um, up here, the native um, milkweed is Syriaca. And I was told by a biologist that there is um, a Sleepia incarnata as well, which is the swamp milkweed. But I know that um, the I'm just waiting for them to come up now that the snow is starting to go. The ones I planted last year of the Syriaca, they they are in the bush. They they all got planted in the bush, and they they just grow naturally here. So it's one of the native plants here. It's just that they have been taken out everyone thought they were weeds and Ingrid you said that they were taken off the um, invasive plant list noxious noxious weed list the noxious weed list yes that's a good noxious weed list but they were removed in I, I believe it was 2014 or 15. yes yes that's, well, there is one that's more, a good thing there is one more milkweed that I'm going to tell you about and I, I'm sorry I didn't mention this to you before, Pam, so it's going to be a bit of a surprise to you, but I've grown this successfully. And it's actually a tropical milkweed. And you grow it as an annual. And it's called Asclepius curassavica. And it actually uh, has almost like blood red and orange flowers. And if you start it early inside and then plant them out in planters uh, in full sun, you can also attract uh, monarch butterflies to the tropical milkweeds. Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, what is your time frame for getting into bloom? Because at the beginning of September, we start getting frosts. Yeah, usually that, we're talking northern Ontario, but I know there is other people that will be watching this that are more southern than I am, but. Um, 
it would take quite a while, I believe, to grow them in. It would be something that a greenhouse would be able to do. <laughs> well, I was able to get mine to bloom by July, and that's starting. Oh, them that's wonderful. Indoors, starting them indoors in March. That's wonderful. Hmm. I'll have to look at that. You're going to have to send me that information for me to okay. put that on the, I'm the Facebook, and I'm going to have to try it as well. <laughs> it's past March now, but I, may I do have grow lights. <laughs> <laughs> okay, onward and upward. This is where Ingrid's going to be jumping in because Ingrid gave me a list of plants. And... Um, Hopefully, I found the right images to go along with the plants. Um, of course, there's many species of plants. And so I picked what I thought was in this area, but she can correct me if I'm wrong. Now, of course, the host plants are for the growing larvae. Correct. Larvae. Larva. <clears throat> and so we'll start with the list Ingrid gave me. So... Ingrid, maybe you can start explaining what all these are. So um, a lot of um, butterflies, as you mentioned, Pam, a lot of butterflies are um, generalists as opposed to specialists like the monarch is. And so a number of different uh, types of plants will be um, host or larval plants for them. So um, there are butterflies, for instance, <laughs> that will lay their eggs on various trees. And they're very specific uh, in the, well, they're not specific, they're general in, in terms of that they generally like to feed on trees, um, but they're not necessarily all of the same genus. So, for instance, um, I'm just going to go and see if I can find one of the butterflies that I listed that I know that feeds on a number of trees here in my little um, reference book that I had in front of me when I put the list together. Um, so, for instance, uh, skippers, a silver-spotted skipper, likes to feed on um, locusts, um, Canada took honey locust, so there's the um, black locust, which is a robinia, the honey locust. They're all members of the same uh, family of plants, so let's put it that way. So all the plants that are in the pea family, for instance. So um, I'm trying to actually find which one um, fed on the ash trees specifically. But uh, if, you, uh, look, if you look around at native uh, trees that you have uh, close to you, you will often see a lot of damaged leaves on them because there have been various insects, including um, caterpillars of various butterflies, feeding on the leaves. So ash, unfortunately in southern Ontario, we're going to probably lose more than 90% of the population of our ash trees because of emerald ash borer. I don't yes. know that's true in the north. That, that's terrible. Um, I I believe we're we're right at the cutoff where uh, we had the communities in bloom come last year to get to check out Smooth Rock Falls, and he was saying he believed that we are right on the line of the cutoff, but with global warming we can't guarantee anything. If the temperatures get warmer, they will move more north, so. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a point at which um, the, uh, the borer larvae do not survive the winter if it drops be beneath uh, below a certain temperature. So you must be in that area where it is too cold for them to survive. I wish we had colder winters so that we could wipe them out. So well, I, I know they survive in Gogama because when we were down there, we would see them on the trees and we would hear the larva chewing the trees oh my. when it was quiet. I mean, yeah, they go crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> so I found the reference. The ash is one of the preferred larval trees for Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. One wow. of my favorite butterflies. That's a big one. That's, a, that's big a big one. Yeah. So if you lost a lot of ash trees, you might be losing a lot of those as well. But that same butterfly also likes uh, wild plum, wild cherry, um, service berries, hawthorns, apples, mountain ash, cottonwood, and willows and birches. So wow. 
if we lose one species, I think we're still good to keep the butterfly. Yes. We're going to go on to the next one. We've got the birch, Betula. Betula. Species. So, and there are, so that is, uh, that looks like a silver birch that you've got yes, there. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of native birch species. And for those of you who love to garden, I would recommend, you know, and I would have to go and check to see whether they would survive as far north. But um, one of my fa favorites is yellow birch because it gets a beautiful bronzy colored peeling bark, very much like the paper birch, but a, but a much deeper color. And of course, this is another um, tree that is favored by the eastern swallow tail butterfly. Cool. So we'll go on to the next one. So we've got the black locust you were talking about. Yes. Is yes. is that the right picture that goes with it? It looks like that that is a black locust. So they have these beautiful pea-like flowers on them. They do get um, kind of a, a fairly long bean-like pod in the fall. And it is a, um, a tree that is favored by the silver spotted skipper. Cool. I, I just looking at that, I was saying, oh, I want one. I wonder if it'll grow up here. And I said, probably thorns. not, but. <laughs> I'll warn you, they have thorns. <laughs> oh, I love thorns. It'll oh. keep the bears away. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, it should grow up to zone three, I would think. Crab apples, if you can grow them. I think there is a Siberian crab apple that will grow in the north. Uh, and we have humongous crab apple trees. We have 50 foot crab apple trees here. And we also have some very small, in town, we have some very small trees that taste like Macintosh apples. So, what I am trying to do is trying to graft those very sweet they're about half the size of a macintosh but i tell you they taste better and in just in a backyard in smooth rock falls so i am trying to going to try and get a whole bunch of different apple grafts and graft them onto one tree to see what i can get growing up here well yeah that's a whole side discussion on on grafting but yeah. you know, that's a great idea so again, this is one of the preferred uh, trees of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail um, larva. Yeah. Yeah, well we have, it must, it must be a food source for a lot of butterflies up here because we just have humongous crab apple trees and I'm, I'm not saying that they're small, they're, they're so big, they just take the, uh, the temperatures to heart and I'm just surprised every time I see them in full bloom, just completely red trees that are two, three times the size of the houses here. So that's a good one so that we know, I'm gonna have to go looking and see what butterflies fly around those crab apple trees. Mm -hmm since there's so many of them in town. And the honey locust I images. Yes, that is a honey locust. Again, as you can see, it's a member of the pea family, Fabaceae, um, and it gets those long pods on them, um, a compound leaf, very small leaflets. This one, I think, also has um, thorns on it, and it will get pea-like flowers. Um, and again, this is one of the trees that is favored by the skipper. So there are a number of different skippers that, uh, that like to feed on this one, the silver spotted skipper. Now the oak tree it has her backyard, but it's protected. And I believe it's the one that's the most northern one, and I don't know the name right now. Uh, but it is growing, and it looks like that. <laughs> but it hasn't reached over her cedar hedge yet, which is about 15 feet high. So I'm wondering what's going to happen when it gets the winter winds once it's past the cedar. But I guess we'll wait and see. This looks like a swamp white oak, actually. Um, and oak, again, is, uh, I think this is another one of the species, no, it's not the one for the eastern tiger swallowtail, but oak is, the whole family of oak support the uh, more Lepidoptera, which is the, 
the genus name for, or the family name for all butterflies and moss than any other tree other than willows. So wow. this, uh, the family, the oak family supports a huge variety of different kinds of butterflies and moths. So we should all be trying to grow oak trees. If, they, if they're going to grow up here, let's plant them. <laughs> we'll have to see which type my sister has in her yard. So I have mostly um, red oaks in mine. Yeah. Well, you're a little farther south, but yeah. we'll see. Just a little. And the service berry. We know that'll grow up here. <laughs> that is another fabulous, you know, shrub tree. In most places it grows like a small tree. Um, and again, this is uh, one of the ones that is favored by the skipper, I think, the skipper family. I'm trying to find the reference that I used for that one. Um, and of course, the, the benefit of this is not only does it feed the larva but it, um, as a larval food, but it also provides nectar when it flowers, right? And it's, it's a plant that flowers very early. Mm -hmm. I noticed you didn't have Saskatoon berry on there, and okay. I didn't know this which, is the same, if they're home. This is the same family. So the the reason I wrote service berry is because that, and that's why we shouldn't use common names, because <laughs> you could say Saskatoon yes. berry, I could say service berry, and we could both be referring to the same plant, and it's the yeah. name, which is the Amelanchier, and the uh, canadensis is one of them, and that might be the Saskatoon berry. I see. Yeah, well, that's that's why we stick to the Latin names or the the official names because we don't want to get mixed up. And like we said, the 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 species. There's so many species within like one family, so. I'm hoping people look into or even ask us questions about which plants would be good for their area for the butterfly gardening. So there is another swallowtail that feeds off of service berry. It's called the two-tailed tiger swallowtail, but it would detract that as well. Two-tailed? Yeah. Hmm, I've never heard of that one. Neither have I. So the sumac, we actually have sumac growing at the corner of our we can't get it out of the garden at our service station here in town. And I thought it only grew in areas like around um, uh, Georgian Bay, where I used to live, it were everywhere. And we've got them growing here because they are in completely dry soil. This is a cement, not a cement, a brick wall. That's a standalone brick wall that prevents, so people can park behind it on the highway and there's a few little trees in it and we have sumac growing in it and perfectly hardy and it doesn't grow that tall but they keep coming back so that that is a surprise for this area because that would definitely be zone two where they are they're right just against the highway no protection from wind or anything well sumac is a pretty hardy plant and again, this is, uh, you know, something that um, you may not want growing in the main part of your garden because they do tend to sucker. So, um, mm -hmm. but it is a, a, a plant that supports a, a couple of different species I'm trying to find. And I should have probably cross-referenced these so I could find them quickly. But it does support a number of different species of, uh, of butterfly larvae. Well, we're not here to and it feeds birds. make specifics on the on the butterflies. We're not here to teach about butterflies as as we want people to have butterfly gardens and attract all the butterflies that we do have around the area. So it's really interesting to note that some of these plants that we've seen and didn't know they were food sources for the butterflies that that we're finding out that that they're actually good for the butterflies and maybe we should leave a few of them in instead of instead of pulling them all out <laughs> i have a back corner of my property that i allow the uh the sumacs to spread and grow in that back corner of the property and it creates kind of a nice little area that i just leave a little bit wild and that's fine that's great and the wild plums and wild cherries. Ah, now this is a great family of plants because in this you can get 
um, pin cherries, um, black cherries, uh, choke cherries. There's, uh, and I'm trying to think of uh, what the, I don't know if there are wild plums that actually grow your, uh, as far north as, as you are, um, like sloes, that sort of plum. Um, but these are uh, trees that do support a lot of different kinds of, uh, of butterflies as well. And the double bonus here is because they get fruit on them, they also feed birds. And the flowers feed uh, a whole slew of different kinds of pollinators, most of them being the, uh, the native um, types of bees, right? So this is a plant that does almost triple duty. Yes, we want those bees in our gardens as well. So I don't mind the bees coming in and sharing with the butterflies. <clears throat> and the willow. That's what grows in my backyard <laughs> because my backyard is in the swamp. <clears throat> willows are great. If you have um, wet soil, then, you know, willows are some of the trees that you need to look to to be growing instead of plants like oak which like higher and, and drier ground right so if you do have wet patches uh put some willows in and um pussy willows are great because they do provide um pollen in very early spring for the first emerging uh bumblebee queens so when those yes. uh you know first emerging queens and first emerging bees are coming out uh, it is the willows that they are looking to for the food. And of course, the whole willow family provides uh, food for all of the swallowtail butterflies. So any of the swallowtails will use uh, various types of willows as larval food. Well, you're just a wealth of information. <laughs> shrubs. shrubs as host plants. You know, sometimes people... <clears throat> They, uh, some some people don't even realize that trees are good sources of food for uh, butterflies. But now we're getting into things that will actually fit in someone's garden. So uh, shrubs as host plants for butterflies. So the alder. Exactly. And this I know for a fact because I've been in the north and I know that this is a, a plant that occurs all over the north, right? So naturally, yes. Naturally, naturally it does. And again, very adapted to the climate. And it may not be something that, that you've thought of trying to put in your garden, but if you do have a garden where you have a corner like uh, um, you know, that, that will allow you to plant a couple of these, these are certainly shrubs that will support um, a number of different butterfly species. And I think it's- And there's shrubs that will survive compared to some of the shrubs you go and buy a Canadian tire oh, and are dead uh, by spring. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, if you know that this is a shrub that's going to survive up there, why would you spend money on something that's gonna die after the first winter, right? Yes. <laughs> and it's good for the butterflies. So now we come to bearberry or kinnikinnik. Yes, another plant that I know that grows up north. Um, and so this is, you know, call it a shrub. I call it a shrub because it is actually a woody plant, even though it grows fairly low and close to the ground, but that's its mechanism for survival. And I haven't got off the top of my head which butterfly species, but again, a very multi-purpose plant I would love to be able to grow this in my garden, but I don't have the right conditions for it. Because this is a plant that likes dry, as you can see, the way it's growing in very dry, gravelly soil. Rock. Sun, <laughs> and probably fairly acidic soil as well, which, you know, down here in, in my region, we can't find acidic soil anywhere. So um, this is, and it supports uh, various bird species feed on the berries and a Sure, it's called bear berries because the bears like them too. So, you know, berries are know. berries. I don't think you want bears in your backyard, but I think well, we get them anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think it's a lovely little plant. Yes, might work in a big pot that you could keep drier. I don't yeah. know. Oh, no, as long as it goes under the snow. Yeah, blackberries. Oh, I love blackberries. <laughs> 
berries. Yeah. But we don't have them up here. We have raspberries and we have other things, but we do not have blackberries. That's more down south, but hey, they, they attract butterflies. Well, that whole family, Rubus, will will be the larval food for uh, certain butterflies. And, and I mean, all of the way I look at shrubs is anything that does that serves more than one purpose is a great plant to put in your garden. So, you know, if you can't grow blackberries, then grow raspberries, but they do the same thing. They will give you fruit. They will provide uh, larval food. And uh, because of the way the canes tend to bend over and uh, start growing again from the tips, they provide, um, you know, these nice little colonies that, that provide shelter for um, smaller bees and other insects as well, right? Yes, so. and exactly, you, uh, talking about the way they propagate themselves, people shouldn't be trying to hold them up all the time because if they let them lay down on the ground, they will make more raspberries <laughs> and blackberries <laughs> instead of deciding to go and buy more plants. You can grow your own just by letting them lean over and touch the ground. Well, because they usually bear fruit on one-year-old wood, right? Mm -hmm. So Yes. You want fresh new wood coming out every year. Exactly. And next? the blueberry. This is our area of expertise up here. We get blueberries from here to Gogama. No problem. Everyone goes out blueberry picking. So we all know what a blueberry is. And everyone wants them in their backyard. But as soon as you put them in your backyard, they don't want to grow. <laughs> because our soil is not the bush soil. And they seem to grow in very sandy soils up here. Yes. Uh, areas areas like where you find drainage. very dry. Yeah, they like good drainage, but they also like soil that is uh, acidic. And so, um, you know, again, this is, um, I like, whenever I'm looking about uh, evaluating shrubs that I want to put in my garden, I'm looking for those that are multi-purpose. And this one is, this hits it out of the, it gets beautiful little bell-shaped flowers in the spring. It has, uh, you know, little glossy green leaves and then you get berries and then the leaves turn a gorgeous color in the fall. What's not to like? Yes. Yes. And I love the little, the little flowers on them. They are just, just unbelievable. They're so cute. And then they, turn into these giant berries compared to the size of the flower. <laughs> it's a great little plant if you can grow it. Yeah. And buckthorn. I've wanted to try buckthorn, uh, but I haven't tried yet. So this is uh, this looks like sea buckthorn, this particular one. Yeah, I, I have so. a friend who uh, not far from me who grows this. one. I don't know if this one grows up north or not, but Ramnus, the family, which includes, of course, the, uh, the invasive species that we have rampaging all over southern Ontario, which is the European or the common buckthorn, um, which I'm not a fan of. But um, buckthorns actually are a, a larval food for butterflies as well. And if you have the uh, North American version of or sea buckthorn, which is supposed to be one of those super, super berries, I think. Super food now, you know, super everybody? food. Superfoods or something. I don't know. I've never tried them myself, but I mean, yeah, you know, again, all the farmers are starting to grow it. Well, there you go. It, so. so there could be money in it. <laughs> there could be money in it, but I just want it for myself. And the lilac. And I put lilac. this in because a lot of people don't realize that the common lilac is also a larval food plant for butterflies. And I mean, you know, what's not to love about beautiful lilac? Yes. Spring, right? Yes. Now, I want to, I have a question about that. My sister bought uh, her home and the people that built the home was Italian. And they put in the species that they had known in Italy. I, I think this is how it went. And none of her lilacs have any scent, no fragrance. Mm. So I'm wondering, it would, I'm thinking that it might have to have a fragrance to be useful for butterflies because the fragrance is what attracts them. Or would there still be nectar in those types of lilacs that don't have as much scent? Um, I don't know that the scent really makes a difference as to whether or not it has uh, nectar in it. 
And what we're concerned when we're talking about larval food, we're not really concerned about the flowers at all. We're concerned about the leaves. No, not the larval food. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so um, still might be good. I would I still I'll have to check. As long as it's a member of the syringa species, that that oh, yeah. is still a plant that will sur support the. Um, let me tell you again, it's this two tailed swallowtail that happens to like this one. So. Cool. Yeah, my sisters are very, very light pink, whereas the ones around here are very purplish, yes. much more purple. And hers are more like the picture. They're very light pink. I and think there are some French lilacs or some other lilacs that probably, uh, I've never heard of one that isn't scented, but it's likely that, because I know that people have those little, um, down here we grow the dwarf lilacs, which oh. are, I think they're Korean lilacs. They're quite common here. A lot of people have them grafted as standards. So mm -hmm. a little off tangent on lilacs. Let's keep going. <laughs> Hang on, get going. There, Labrador tea. Well, this is what grows out in the bush. We exactly. don't even have to try to grow this. <laughs> this is growing everywhere. That's what's holding up the uh, populations of butterflies right in the bush. If you're going in the bush and wondering where are all these things coming from? Well, they're feeding on the native species right there in the bush. Well, and that's important. I think people <laughs> need to recognize that there are, the butterflies are adapted to a lot of the native species that grow I, we would call them indigenous species in the area where we as humans have settled. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can have this in your garden if you have the right conditions, or you can recognize that this is a plant that in its native habitat also supports certain butterfly species. Yes. And the New Jersey tea? Same, yes. It actually has a different common name down here, which I had never heard before, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head what that was. But again, uh, a plant that does grow well in the north and um, supports um, certain species of butterflies and provides uh, nectar, again, for, for both butterflies and bees. And pioneers, if you're in the bush looking for something to drink tea with, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know how it got its name. I have no idea. <laughs> You'd be surprised what the pioneers are eating and drinking. <laughs> I'm sure. And rhododendron. This one is, I believe, yes, uh, rhododendron canadense. Yes, this is um, our, uh, yes, the wild rhododendron that grows up north as well. So, again, mm -hmm. a plant that supports um, butterfly species which I didn't know. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that these were also um, larval, uh, larval plants. I was a little bit surprised when I, uh, when I found that in my list. So Well, we have to learn something new every day, so. Yes, I agree. We do. And the viburnum. Everyone sees viburnum everywhere. And there are quite a few different kinds of white burnum. So um, there is the nanny berry and the um, maple leaf viburnum and the high bush cranberry, which of course gets those bright red berries in the fall. And so there's a number of different species and they do support uh, a number of different kinds of, uh, of larval, uh, butterfly larvae. So, and, and of course, some of them are, are really beautiful when they're in bloom, right? Yes, yes, they are. And herbaceous toast, I'll get it out. Herbaceous host plants. <laughs> we'll go on to the list. Pearly everlasting. Well, I see there along the train tracks, along the roadsides. All you have to do is step out of your, your car, your truck along the roadsides up here, and they're there. And so if you decide to grow this in your garden and you go out one day and you find that the plant is half eaten, do not despair. It means you have the caterpillar of the American painted lady. And that is wow. a preferred larval food for the American painted lady butterfly. And that's, we like them. They're beautiful little butterflies, I agree. And dill. Everyone grows dill. My only problem here is slugs. <laughs> so it's not quite the caterpillar as I want. <laughs> so 
slugs love dill too. So the dill family, fennel, if you can also grow it, are uh, parsley and are also preferred um, larval plant foods for swallowtail butterflies. And mm -hmm. I keep, I let the dill in my garden self seed. I'm, I'll take out some if they're in places I don't want them, but I sort of let it grow randomly in the garden. And I usually have um, at least, you know, three or four caterpillars show up every year. And I just leave the plants just for the caterpillars. Well, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> you keep a patch for yourself and give the big patch to the caterpillars. So if you see a green and black and yellow striped caterpillar, it's the uh, it's the swallowtail butterfly caterpillar cool. feeding, on your, feeding on your dill. Be eating our go and get the dry, dry stuff out of the cupboard <laughs> because they eat more than we do. <laughs> golden golden alexanders yeah cesias this is a lovely pollinator plant i really like having this in the garden for the same um you know the beautiful yellow flowers and again this is a, a larval plant food so um it feeds pollinators and it feeds uh butterfly caterpillars it looks like it would have a lot of pollen yes it is it is a very it's a great pollinator plant um and it showed up and i you know again i don't remember which specific butterflies but um it does provide larval food as well so again a multi-purpose plant to add to the garden mallows now, not sure if you can grow uh what's it called the uh, rose mallows or swamp rose mallows up north well we have mallows okay well there you go um, <clears throat> I'm not sure which species it is, but we've got mallows and they will self seed. So um, there are various uh, varieties of common checkered skippers that love to um, lay their eggs on various mallow plants. So this is a great larval plant. And, and what's not to love about hibiscus flowers, right? Yes. <laughs> They're so pretty. Problem we have down here is it's also a favorite food of uh, Japanese beetles. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't have them up here, so thank goodness. It's global warming may be coming, no, but it's not going to in the time that I'm going to be gardening. <laughs> so, <laughs> here's one of my yes. favorite plants. Yes, milkweed or the and I have a patch in my garden. It's probably about half an acre of just milkweed. <laughs> And, and I've left it there for a reason. I've threatened my husband with death if he ever runs the lawnmower down there. <laughs> um, and my favorite time of year is when the plants are in bloom and you walk around it and the scent is just fabulous. It, it's a vanilla, but just a hint of something else in it. And it is absolutely wonderful. I would grow these in my garden if I knew they weren't going to sort of, you know, take over everywhere. I would love to have them in my garden, but I leave them in a back corner of the property. Well, so, I'm going to be starting mine soon. So I'm just hoping within a few years, I'll have that scent floating around. It just takes a long time to get the patches started. You need so many and to get them self seeding. Yes. And I leave, uh, I collect some seed, but I leave a lot of the seed just to, you know, either float away on the wind or just to fall down and, and start new plants. So uh, again, this is the um, larval plant for the monarch butterfly. And this is the one that we're all very concerned about because there's been a huge collapse in the population. And uh, the good news about milkweeds is it supports an entire community of insects. If you have milkweeds, you will have various milkweed beetles um, and, and other insects that specialize just in the milkweed itself. So it's, it's a very great plant that attracts a, a whole community of different kinds of beneficial insects to your garden. Well, you see, what's, I learn something new every day. <laughs> what's not to love about the dried uh, seed pods? I use those in oh, I love them. all arrangements. I go down and I collect the dried seed heads and I use them um, for making up my um, fall arrangements on my front porch. Cool, because oh, they're, they're just unbelievable. They look alien mm -hmm. and spiky. <laughs> yeah. 
So we'll get to the next one here. Milk fetch. Is that the right picture for milk yeah, fetch? That's a milk fetch, astragalus. So there is a number of different um, species in the astragalus family. And again, this is a, a plant that is a larval plant food. I believe it's for the skippers. So the plants, uh, the, the ones that tend to like the, the um, uh, plants in the pea family, because this is, again, I think a, a plant that's in that family. So this would be the skippers and cloudy wings and dusky wings that would prefer this type of plant for their larval plant food. And again, it's a plant that has very interesting uh, flowers on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have seen it, but I just don't know where. So I'm just going to have to keep my eye out for it because it's probably floating around somewhere around here. And something everyone is familiar with, easy. Yeah, and they exactly. they grow on the roadsides. They grow anywhere man disturbs. <laughs> exactly. So um, you know, again, I want to include some plants that just uh, this is actually not a native plant. It's been introduced into North mm -hmm. America, but again, it provides. And you were talking earlier about you know what butterflies feed on is those you know um, flat ray type flowers, and of course, this is one that occurs in a lot of places. And uh, and is also larval food. So you know it, it. I know people consider it a weed, but you know, if you have a patch of it somewhere, or you know of a patch of it somewhere, don't go running over and cutting it down. Just leave it. Yes, a weed by any other name. <laughs> it's a weed is only a weed if you don't want it. <laughs> I think there's another quote about a weed being a plant that we just haven't grown to love yet or something. Yes, yes. well, I like weeds, oh. although the neighbors don't like my weeds. Yeah. So trefoil. Trefoil. So there is a number of them. Uh, the Desmodium canadense is one that I've had in my garden, um, and they grow to be quite tall, get these beautiful little pink uh, pea-like flowers. And again, this is uh, in the pea family, so those butterfly species that prefer um, the pea family as their larval food sources, which are the cloudy wings and the skippers that we've talked about earlier, um, would um, use this as their larval plant food. Um, we, have, we have native up here, the, the very short, very small, bright yellow bird's foot trefoil. The uh, bird foot trefoil is actually a different um, genus, I think. Okay. I don't All think right. it's not Desmodium, but that might be a plant in the same general grouping. Okay, we'll go on to the next one, the wild pea. So um, sweet peas and wild peas, same family, right? Lotharis. And mm -hmm. so everyone loves sweet peas. And everyone loves sweet peas. Uh, and again, that same, so these, a lot of these plants are in that same um, group, that family group of the pea family that certain butterflies prefer as their larval food. So this again is another plant that you could consider adding to your garden that would provide larval food for those skippers and dusky wings that like members of the pea family. And it's an attractive plant. Does it have a nice smell like the sweet peas? Do you know? I don't know. I've never grown wild peas. I didn't. I hadn't even heard about it until I did this research. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we gotta learn new stuff all the time. So this is and not the wild carrot with down here. So, but of course, this is one I'm very familiar with, which is, of course, you know, some people call it Queen Anne's lace. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, wild carrot is the is the more proper uh, terminology for it. Again, not a native plant. It was introduced by the European settlers when they came over um, back when, and it has now, of course, been naturalized across you know most of Canada. But this is uh, a plant that provides uh, again uh, larval food for uh, certain butterflies as well as uh, good sources of pollen. And I will often see monarch butterflies landing on the um, um, wild carrot flowers. For a food source, for, for food nectar. Source. For nectar, yes. Yes, I grew some in pots 
last uh, last year, and so I overwintered them in pots under the snow. So we'll see if they survive or not, since they are biennial, I believe. They are a biennial. Um, most of the fan. So there's, um, and it would probably again. This is just one representative of an entire family of plants that would su probably support that same family of uh, butterflies. So wild carrot, wild parsnip, um, cow parsnip. There's a whole um, group of fam that get these. Um, we call them the umbellifers, right? They get these mm -hmm. like an umbrella, <laughs> like an umbrella. Like umbrella. Exactly, umbellifers. They get these these almost flattish discs of flowers, and of course, you don't want to be growing giant hogweed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is an umbrella. But and so, if there is anyone out there listening, you can join our conversation by sending us a question to the URL, the address at the top of your screen. So just to let you know. And the fourth step to creating a butterfly out of the five steps is you need nectar plants. And nectar plants, I think, is what most gardeners think about when they imagine a butterfly garden. Hundreds of butterflies floating around drinking nectar. They do not eat pollen. They only drink nectar. Um, if you only want to attract full-grown butterflies and don't want to worry about the caterpillars, at least it'll help in part so um, that the butterflies can drink from if you're not going to try and save the, the you know, group hundreds of plants together to support uh, monarch butterfly larvae. Anything you can do in your garden by supporting, uh, by planting nectar plants will help a wide variety of pollinators. So we'll get back to Ingrid's list again that she gets hyssop. One of my favorite plants. I have this in my garden and I love it because when you walk past it, especially early in the morning when the sun is just starting to, uh, to shine onto it, you get that gorgeous scent of licorice. Ooh. is what this gives off so anise hyssop and this is an absolute magnet for all kinds of butterflies and all kinds of bees it is just a i have a clump that looks almost like that and literally mm -hmm. it is a alive on a summer's day it is it is wow wonderful. it is absolutely wonderful so it is a a fabulous larval plant to have all right. Well, now you've got me wanting to go get a big bunch of anise hyssop. <laughs> yeah. Um, it self seeds like mad if you let it. So one of the things that I do, I make a point of deadheading my flowers, be so I, I I still end up with seedlings, but they're easy enough to pull up. So okay. black eyed Susan. Well, we can always give them. More. <clears throat> well, we we missed the aster, so we have to go back to the aster. Aster family, of course. Um, Aster family, again, uh, a great family of, of plants. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention, what you want to do when you put nectar plants in your garden, whether it's for butterflies or whether you're trying to support pollinators in general, you want to make sure that you have continuous bloom from the earliest possible in spring to late fall. It's important that the butterflies that are active at all times of the year have food sources available to them. Like Pam's poor little butterfly that was fluttering around with no flowers. <laughs> I, I don't know how that guy was gonna survive, but asters is one of those flowers that is a late uh, summer, fall bloomer. And so this is a great source of nectar for butterflies late in the season, especially monarchs because they will visit a lot of aster plants because they're trying to get up as much carbohydrate as possible late in the season so that they can make their migration down to Mexico. Yes, and for people that don't know, there are multiple generations of monarchs that will stay, and just the last generation born right before the fall is the one that, that migrates south. Correct. And I have wild asters here, and if I put uh, 
a hybridized aster and then just let one weedy aster come up all the bumblebees and all the butterflies will be on the weedy native aster and they'll ignore the other one unless the you know unless you go and weed out the asters and don't leave anything then they have to go to the hybridized one so well there have been a lot of studies done and it has been uh i think there is research that demonstrates that um butterflies and pollinators will prefer native plants which they have co-evolved with over those that are um, hybrid plants in your garden it's yes that's why the weeds grow in amongst my as long as they have flowers i say hey they're flowers they're not a weed they're a flower i'm growing it on purpose then what can people say you have to call they're the wild among a wildflower not a weed <laughs> a wildflower yeah well <laughs> They ask me why I have weeds. I, uh, I just say, yeah, it's a wildflower. A native plant. It's another nicer way to put okay, it. Okay, the black-eyed Susan. Black-eyed Susan. Yeah, native plant. And one of these, uh, and, and this one blooms earlier in the summer than the asters do, um, and they actually bloom continuously for uh, for a while. Um, and, you know, what's not to love about black-eyed Susan? It's a beautiful, sunny, little yellow you know, ray flowers with a little brown uh, in the center and a great source of, uh, of nectar for butterflies. And it just makes it feel like summer. It's, it's such a sunny plant, exactly. <laughs> and one of your favorites, that, as well as mine. Yeah, it's another one of my favorites, Blazing Star. Um, I think the Leatris spicata is probably the only one you can grow in the north. We have a little more choice down here, but that whole family are absolute butterfly magnets. And uh, it has been demonstrated, and again, uh, for those that bloom later in the season, and I'm trying to remember when my blazing stars bloom, um, that the butterflies will actually cluster on them and just fill up on nectar from these plants. They, they just absolutely love them. Mm -hmm. And they're just, I think it's just such a cool looking plant. You look at that. <laughs> Spiky and stem, fluffy. You know, <laughs> fluffy purple stuff coming off. It looks like something. Yeah, from, it's, you know. and it's purple. What can you say? Ah. I mean, I love purple. I just, uh, I just bought a whole bag of bulbs that i haven't planted in my garden so i'm going to add more <laughs> speaking flower. of purple the purple cone flower purple commonly flower. known as the purple cone flower echinacea purpurea and if you're going to grow echinacea purpurea in your garden i recommend you try and find the unadulterated uh native echinacea purpurea i know that there are hundreds of different hybrids that have been created and cultivar actually cultivars they're not necessarily hybrids of this particular flower but try and get as close as possible to the original native species which is the echinacea purpurea and uh, you will be rewarded with butterflies that will feed on those in your garden the problem is with some of the newer ones the double ones the the you know orange colors they just uh, because they have been bred for specific colors or shapes they don't provide the same amount of nectar and the butterflies just are not attracted to them yeah and i grow mine from seed so i pick seed from the purple cone flowers and then just grow them and then replant them so and, and then I, they will self seed yes yeah, so i leave my cone flowers in my garden for the winter and the finches, because I always have uh, gold finches that stay for the winter at my place, and they eat the the seeds. They love them. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> another great one. And goldenrod, which is a weed, but I've always, ever since I was a kid, I have loved goldenrod. It's just so pretty to me. It just speaks to summer. So a, a couple of myths about goldenrod. First of all, a lot of people think that goldenrod is the plant that causes hay fever. It's yeah. not. <laughs> hay fever is caused by something called ragweed, mostly. And ragweed has very inconspicuous flowers. It's a completely different looking plant. And its pollen is windborne. Goldenrod pollen is fairly heavy. 
and goldenrod has to be pollinated by bees uh, and other pollinators. So that's the first misconception about goldenrod. The second one is that it's a weed. It's a set. <laughs> Um, there are varieties of, so goldenrod, Solidago canadensis, which is the uh, common goldenrod, does tend to be a bit of a thug in the garden. I will acknowledge that because I have had a couple of patches and I have to be very careful to keep it under control because it spreads by underground runners. Mm -hmm. But there are other species of goldenrod um, that are much better behaved in the garden. And so those might be things that you want to consider planting somewhere in your garden to have these beautiful yellow flowers. And by the way, in Europe, goldenrod is actually a, a garden plant. They buy them and they plant them. Of course, the they're yeah. smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, go look up zigzag goldenrod. Go look up... Um, uh, the different kinds of, of goldenrods that actually occur natively in Ontario and, you know, avoid the one that's a bit of a garden thug if, and try growing it in your garden. And attract or let the thug take over and have a beautiful yellow lawn. <laughs> you could do that too. And this is Joe Pie Weed because it's it's I I swear you you can't drive past them without seeing the butterflies on them. Absolutely, this is a plant that is another one like the Liatris is almost a butterfly magnet. Uh, blooms uh, mid to late summer and again with those beautiful huge clusters of flowers provides a perfect landing pad for as you can see here that beautiful swallowtail butterfly. And so it's a perfect plant. Of course, depending on where you are, they can grow as tall as six or seven feet. But they do like to have damp soil, don't they? Uh, I, I grow mine and I have grown them in ordinary garden soil. But, you know, maybe that's because where I am, we, you know, we might have a little more. I, I have probably a higher water table here, so that means there is probably a certain amount of dampness always in my soil. Yes, mm -hmm. they certainly do like wet. They do like wet areas. That's true. Well, I have a wet area, so <laughs> they like my house. <laughs> and we did for some reason we got milkweed in there twice. That oh, okay. So we can talk about flowers. We could talk about swamp milkweed. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's go back. Go, Let's back. go back. We talked about common milkweed, um, and we could talk about mm -hmm. swamp milkweed, which is similar, but uh, the flowers are very different. And uh, the interesting thing about swamp milkweed is, again, it's not as um, aggressive in the garden as its cousin, the common milkweed, is. So oh. it tends to grow in fairly nice, well-behaved clumps, and it doesn't run off uh, and colonize right through your garden. So if, uh, if the habits of uh, common milkweed are a little too much for you, then you might want to consider growing swamp milkweed instead. And that's Asclepias incarnata. Correct. Likes moist soil, but I grow it, again, in ordinary garden soil, and it does just fine in my garden. Sounds good to me. And these are my, one of my favorite. And um, I have a favorite that oh, now, and I'm terrible with names. I'm terrible with people names. Um, okay, you're going to have to go on until I remember the name. Helianthus helianthemum, Maximilian sunflowers? No, no, this is one that we eat. <laughs> oh, Jerusalem artichokes. Jerusalem artichokes, and they're not even artichokes. They are a sunflower. <laughs> sunchokes. Some people call them sunchokes. Some people call them Jerusalem artichokes. Oh yeah, they're just going. They're another superfood, but uh, they're low in carbohydrate. Instead of having honest, potatoes, it's like dirt. I'm. They're. Not, I'm not a fan. <laughs> it tastes it's like dirt. Like well, you're not supposed to eat them raw. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, helianthus, sunflowers, uh, a whole family of anywhere from the common annual sunflower that we grow is also a member of this family, but there is a whole group of um, perennial helianthus as well 
that we can grow in our gardens that get the same beautiful little uh, bright yellow flowers on them that again provide um, you know food for um, butterflies. So and they all have those little tubular flowers inside the ray. Exactly. So you know, great landing spot for you know small and large butterflies, and and they love to. Oh, this is another one of my fa garden favorites. <laughs> the wild bergamot. Oh, absolutely. Um, love the flowers. Uh, again, you know, that wonderful kind of shaggy looking uh, pinky purple flower and uh, great uh, sources of food for butterflies, for bees, and for hummingbirds. Oh, yes, yes. And of course, if you really are adventurous, you can uh, dry the flowers and the leaves and brew tea because bergamot is the um, flavoring for Earl Grey tea. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of things we could go out eating, but I think I'm going to leave them all my plants for the butterflies right now. <laughs> I do that too. And the last thing on our list is to avoid chemicals in the garden. And why is that important? And I'm talking like pesticides and things like that. Why would you say that's important, Ingrid? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important um, if you want to support wildlife in your garden, I think uh, it's important to avoid the use of any synthetic pesticides as much as possible. Um, and uh, because pesticides, uh, insects are much, um, are, you know, smaller, uh, they tend to absorb more into their bodies. And so we have to be conscious at all. And, you know, you may be targeting a specific pest in your garden, but the pesticide doesn't necessarily uh, stay in one place. So you want to try, if you can, avoiding the use of uh, broad, especially broad spectrum pesticides. Um, I try to avoid the use of pesticides altogether if I can and find other ways of managing pests. And we sort of had a brief discussion earlier about um, the question you had from Claudette on what plants she could put in to keep pests away from her prized plants. And I mentioned uh, monitoring is the first step. So um, getting your garden off of pesticides means that you have to think a little bit differently about the pests in your garden and maybe take steps to identify them, what is bringing them into your garden. And the one thing that I have learned about um, pests coming into your garden is that they usually come after plants that are already stressed in some way. So if you can make sure that your garden plants are watered regularly and that they have uh, good airflow around them and that they're fertilized if they need it or that you've got good mulch around the root zone to keep the roots cool and moist, then you can possibly reduce the amount of uh, pesticide that you need to use in your garden. Because well, these, these plants have coexisted with these bugs and caterpillars for their whole, you know, existence. So just like us, we want to keep us healthy so we don't get sick because our immune system down. We want to keep our plants healthy so their immune systems aren't down and more vulnerable to attack from any pest that comes along. And what's interesting, because having just taken my IPM course, what I've learned is that for most, yeah, most of the pests <laughs> that we have in our gardens, within a very short period of time, there are pests who will go after the pests. And so... Yes, pests are, eat pests. Yes. <laughs> and so there are um, par parasitoids, they're typically called. Some of them are small wasps, um, and they actually lay their eggs right on the bugs or caterpillars or larvae, depending on what it happens to be, and tomato hornworms being one of them. And they will lay their eggs right on their backs. And when those eggs hatch, guess where they go? They go inside and they eat those caterpillars from the inside out. And yes, that's uh, natural pest control. 
Yes, if you can just step back and wait and see exactly. what happens. Exactly. So waiting sometimes is a is is a good thing Watching to do. Watching a tomato hornworm eating your prized tomato plants. It's, it's not. Fun. It's not a good thing, but oh well. And I want to. Can you explain what the Master Gardeners of Ontario is? Sure. Master Gardeners of Ontario is a group of volunteers. I think we now have about thirty-one different uh, groups or chapters across Ontario, um, maybe 32 of Cochrane, uh, which I think is a fairly new group. I, I don't know when I last checked the numbers. And I think we have about 700 volunteer master gardeners across Ontario who spend their time in the community giving gardening advice and education. And now online. And now, and now online. online, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and so this is uh, something that we uh, volunteer to do. We have to take education in order to become Master Gardeners. And we make a commitment to the Master Gardeners of Ontario that we will do so many hours of volunteering every year in order to stay um, current and active as Master Gardeners. That's a great explanation. <laughs> And I want to thank Ingrid, you, thank you, and the Durham Master Gardeners for volunteering to help me run this broadcast today. I could not have done it without all your expertise. And um, our chat room, our question um, chat room, will stay open for a few hours just in case somebody watches this a little later this evening. But it will be uh, shut down later today. But you can ask us a, qu a question anytime on either of our Facebook pages. All you have to do is put in the search on Facebook for Cochrane District Master Gardeners for Northern Ontario. And for Southern Ontario, you can ask a question to the Durham Master Gardeners, and you never even know. Maybe Ingrid will answer your question there. <laughs> I just might. And I want to say thanks for watching, whoever is out there and whoever watches this in the future, because once we stop our broadcast, it will be on YouTube for you to watch again and again in case you've forgotten our plant list that Ingrid was nice enough to give us. Or if you just want to hear us talk for an hour and a half again. <laughs> so thank, thank you, Ingrid, for all your help. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, and we plan to do, not Ingrid, but I plan to do another one every month. So I hope you'll be watching for the next webinar from the Cochrane District Master Gardeners. So for now, I want to say goodbye and thank you, and I hope you'll watch next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.